Hello. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm super excited to share with you something that I think will be extremely impactful to all of our lives, and that is the acceleration of science through design. First, a little bit about me and my background, uh, so you know where I'm coming from. So the cute little guy on the top right is Tetrahymena thermophila. I studied Tetrahymena thermophila in my undergrad and tried to understand the mating type locus. I loved genetics. Back in 1997, I knew that being able to change the genetic code of life will be able to have incredible power. But there was one big problem, and that big problem was speed. It took me three months to isolate the DNA for an experiment, and of course the experiment failed. And so the, the PI tells me, oh, go ahead and redo the experiment. And so I redo the experiment, and it fails again. And of course, the PI looks at me and says, well, you got to do it again. I said, OK, this doesn't make sense. It was cutting edge genomics at the time, but the tools just were so slow. So I went and found design and did a master's in industrial design and ended up at a place called IDEO. And at IDEO, I designed many different things and uh, created this product on the lower right, which many of you guys may have used today, uh, which is the beginning of the Samsung Galaxy curve. And so I understood design as a process. And I always asked myself, what else can design do? And so from then, I went out and built, and built a startup around fitness with my wife. And together, we saw the impact and speed of being able to create ideas from scratch and get direct feedback. Following that experience, I moved to the venture capital side and started an accelerator called IndieBio. But really, what I want to talk to you about today is humanity's looming crisis. So on, this, on the screens that in front of you today, you can see the world population through history. So if you look back all the way to proto-humans five million years ago, you can see that the world population hasn't changed in almost five million years. Until about 200 years ago, there was a huge spike in the world population. What caused this spike? Heroes like Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister and the dawn of medicine. Agriculture didn't create that spike in, in population. Agriculture was 10,000 years ago. You can see it didn't really move the needle, not that much. But medicine changed everything. And so when you look out in the future, in 2100, it is predicted that we're going to have over 12 billion people on the planet. 12 billion people competing for resources that are already limited. This creates scarcity. And scarcity creates inequality. And inequality creates unrest. We're already seeing the beginnings of that at 7 billion people on the planet. So one of two things are going to happen. We're going to continue to have more and more people, or we're going to see the number of people decline through plague, through war. But biology is a technology that can eliminate and solve for scarcity. Because for the first time, we could actually reprogram life to do things more efficiently. We can also use biology as a technology to heal us. And we already do. So not only will we be living longer and having more people on the planet, but with biology, we'll be living better. And finally, after 25, 30 years, we're seeing that biology is accelerating faster than Moore's law. So this is the price of gene sequencing. And gene synthesis is actually not far behind this. What that gives us is a toolkit that can accelerate the development of scientific tools. Design is a process that I learned that actually can help us create products faster and productize biology so that we actually impact the world. And we're not just doing things for knowledge, but doing things to change the way we see it. So if we look at science, science is really just a process to understand nature. 
and has a 10 to 20 year discovery cycle, sometimes longer. This is a diagram from Wikipedia that shows the, design, or the, the process, the scientific method. And it's pretty simple. You have a hypothesis, you test it, you make predictions, and you see how those predictions go, and you alter your theory based on what you see. Pretty basic. The design process is very similar. It just has a different goal. The design process is there to solve human problems. And it has a one week to one year discovery cycle. But after, so after sharing design and explaining design to Fortune 50 CEOs for 10 years, I came down to this simple graph to explain what design process is. You basically learn about something by talking to someone about their problems, and then you make something. And then you see how that actually worked, and you repeat. So really, design and science are two sides of the same coin. And they actually just have different toolboxes and different goals. But by bringing those together, we're able to accelerate the application of science to create transformational companies. So that's the theory. I'd like to share a little bit of practice with you. So, we, I started IndieBio three years ago, and in that time, we funded 68 companies spanning the entire range from agriculture to cellular therapies to cancer. And some early results are the market cap of those 68 companies is over $500 million now. Over $100 million have been raised by these companies from venture capitalists, and over 400 biotech jobs have been created with 70% of our graduates receiving funding. And so we are simply doing that by applying design to biology. And so I'd like to share four lessons, actually, that we got from looking back in the last three years and, and see how we were doing this. The first one is going back to uh, focusing on the problem and not your solution. So Morteza of Kidney uh, created a kidney, an artificial kidney for humans that could be implanted uh, like a portable dialysis machine inside your body. Now, he was able to do this faster than anyone else because he's a materials engineer. And all the people trying to create a kidney right now were doing it from biology because they're all cell biologists. So they were trying to grow a, bio, a, a kidney using stem cells. He saw the problem very simply as a filtration problem. And so applied the right technology to the problem. And here you can see they're already in large animal studies and implanting it into a pig. Two, you need to understand your customer by talking to them. Yes, scientists can talk to customers. And, and scientists have customers when they're building a company. So when you go out to a company, or when you go out to talk to your customers, XDEM makes these stem cells and they make them much cheaper than, than anyone else. And so when they went and talked to scientists and asked if they needed the, uh, the stem cells that, that they were creating, they learned something that was horrifying to them. They learned that price doesn't matter, that no one cares if it's cheaper or not. They're, not, they're paying it. The scientists aren't paying for it themselves. They're paying it out of grants, and the grants were written to include the cost. But what they did learn was what mattered to the scientists was the number of donors. And that didn't have a solution. And because they were cheaper, they found that they were able to get the most amount of donors than any of their competitors, and therefore took a, a foothold in the marketplace. And that, they went from almost a dead company because of their initial, uh, their initial um, assumption to a company that's now very viable. Three, you want product-directed discovery. And this is a really important one. You want to start going from the bench into your product right away. You want to find out where all the demons are in your product uh, uh, process. So Estrona was building a early detection kit for pathogens in the food supply chain. And so they were getting the sensitivity of their test in the lab down, getting the sensitivity of, their uh, of the test in their lab down. 
And every week I tell them, you know, you build a prototype. You got to get onto the line. You have to swab the side of a beef uh, or, you know, swab uh, lettuce to see how someone would actually use it. So they actually made this prototype that you see with scotch tape and everything and found out immediately that the, that the foam tip that they used to pick up the, the bacteria was actually really hard to let go of the bacteria when they put it back into the tube. So little things like that, that became the product development crux actually for this product. It wasn't the actual detection of the RNA, it was picking up cells and letting them go. And if they had waited much longer, they would never have found that out. And so as a startup, you're racing time because you don't have that much money. And so you need to find out all these things as fast as possible. And finally, one of our huge uh, learnings is you need to figure out how to deliver the right value to the right player as fast as possible. A good example of that is mental health. They're using AI to connect uh, cancer patients with uh, cancer clinical trials. And so one of the issues is who's going to pay for this? You would think that the cancer patient does, but they don't. Cancer patients don't pay for anything. Insurance covers everything, but they don't cover this test. The doctors aren't going to pay for it because they don't offer the service, and they they'll do it in their head anyway. That's just an extra cost for them that they don't get back. Hospitals won't do it either. So here's an incredibly valuable service that could change people's lives, but is not going to be a biz viable business and therefore not going to actually uh, survive. Until they figured out they're putting actual genotypic information and phenotypic in information into the same place. And when you do that, it becomes incredibly valuable for pharma because they can stratify clinical trials much better and they'll pay a lot of money for that. And so the business model ended up being taking, sell, having the service free for patients and doctors and then selling the data back out to pharma. And so using design uh, to accelerate science and the speed of science go getting faster and the cost getting lower has led to an explosion of new life science verticals. And these are going to create huge opportunities for us in the next 10, 20 years. And I'd like to share a couple of those with you that we're thinking about a lot at IndieBio. So the first one is really 3D printing human organs and really looking at regenerative medicine as a new way of, of treating uh, different uh, diseases, diseases over the organs. So one of our heroes, Melanie, uh, whom you'll hear from in a little bit, uh, she has figured out how to 3D print microvasculature and has already demonstrated this by printing a lymph node uh, as well as some microvasculature. This is a breakthrough uh, in, for medicine and for where we're going. There will be a time when you don't have to go in and get on a wait list for an organ, but you could actually get your own cells built into an organ for you. Another one is the food supply chain will be completely disrupted. When we talk about 12 billion people left on the, on the planet, 15 billion moving forward, how are we going to feed all of those people? The food supply chain currently is a massive drag on our uh, climate change as well. It's one of the major contributors to climate change. So how do we redesign the entire food supply chain using biology to solve those problems? We have companies like Memphis Meats, Geltor, and others that are removing animals completely from the supply chain and growing these uh, proteins in reactors rather than the old technology of cows and chickens. Next, we'll have Diagnostics 2.0. And that is the incredible amount of data, genomics data, uh, epigenetic data, that will really be able to be mined with increasing computing power and new paradigms of AI and machine learning. And that's going to allow us to really understand how genes are working together, how epigenetics are working, and how evolution is making us who we are. And that's going to give us unprecedented, unprecedented control over what we and how we are. And actually, where we will end up within 50 years is at this place that I like to call homo concilio. And that means designed. Concilio is Latin for designed. So we will start designing humanity 
through gene therapy. We will start with gene therapy. We will fix cancers. We will fix point mutations. But it is an engineering problem at that point to get to a place where we could augment ourselves, become stronger, faster, smarter, all of those things. And that's going to be a very interesting next step. So I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening and be part of the scientific revolution. If you're a scientist or a designer, please think about how we could solve for this planet of, of more people than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you.